Um, okay, good. Now, something else. Something else very important that happened at this time, precisely because string theorists were so interested in this issue of how do you get from a 10-dimensional theory, which is what it turns out superstrings have to be, down to a four-dimensional theory. Well, you have to take six dimensions and curl them up, and there are many ways to do that. And there's a whole theory of mathematics of how to form six-dimensional spaces of various shapes and sizes. And so there began at this time a love affair between string theory and mathematics, because the mathematicians were very interested in these problems, and the physicists were interested, the string theorists were very interested in what the mathematicians had to say, and vice versa. So this is the beginning of a story that will continue through the rest of the talk, a strong link between problems in string theory, which are motivated by trying to actually get the theory of everything, uh, or at least the theory of all particles and forces and so forth, uh, and mathematics. Okay. Now, that's where things stood around 1980 or so. And then um, something finally broke in 1983. They'd been working on this for a long time. And some things worked and some things didn't work. There were some problems with the theory. In 1983, Michael Green and John Schwartz showed there was a key mathematical consistency test. The theory had not been able to satisfy. Well, they figured out that there were, in fact, a few ways that it could be satisfied. So mathematical consistency was shown for five particular types of string theory. Well, they didn't show all five, but that was quickly realized. So there were five string theories which passed a key test. And this got everyone really excited, because I think a lot of people at that time really didn't think this program was going to work. But it worked in a very interesting way. And so people, the, the excitement was enormous. This was the moment the, of the birth. Uh, super duper string theory. Okay, this is this is the this is the this is the beginning of what becomes uh, what you know about today. Okay, but super duper string theory. This is the theory that's supposed to shine your shoes and drive you to work and give you all particles of nature and so forth. And people really believed that they had gotten it. Okay, this is the theory. It works, okay? Before that, it was just my idea. It was just one candidate theory, but now it was really working. And people believed that maybe within two or three years, since they now had it narrowed down just to five string theories, that they could find in one of them a compactification, which would give all the particles we know about. And then they would go in there, and they would calculate the masses of all those particles, and they'd come out right, and they'd be done. Okay, that was 1983. And I know a lot about this, because... Excitement Central was Princeton University. Um, uh, this was one of the places where a lot of that work was done, and I was an undergraduate there at the time. In fact, there were quite a few interesting people there. Uh, David Gross, who won a Nobel Prize in 2004 for work done on the theory of quarks and gluons, I mentioned him before. Uh, he was a professor there, very excited about string theory. Edward Witten, uh, the world's uh, uh, most uh, foremost uh, string theorist, who, was a, who won a Fields Medal in 1990 for mathematical work, uh, was there. Uh, Lawrence Yaffe. Uh, Larry Yaffe, he's a professor at the UW. Uh, he was not working on string theory. Um, but he was there, I met him in. There were some other interesting people there, too, either just before or just, uh, just around this time. For example, uh, there was a fellow there named uh, Stephen Wolfram. Um, he, was a, he was a physics, uh, physics graduate student and postdoc, and he went off to found mathematics. And then there was Nathan Mervold. Uh, who is very well known at Microsoft, now runs Intellectual Ventures. He was a PhD there in, 19, in, 83, in 83, and then he went off to work with Stephen Hawking for a couple of years before deciding that uh, he wanted to do computer work rather than quantum gravity, a la Hawking. And then also, there was another fellow there named Peter Boyd, um, who's now a lecturer in mathematics somewhere. He got a, he got a PhD in 1985, um, and uh, he was working on, none of these people were working on string theory. There were also quite a few famous Strip future string theorists there. I haven't put their names up because you're probably not familiar with them. And then I was there, I was there, I was there, I was class of 1987, and I was watching all of this going on and going to David Gross's talks, his uh, colloquium about the theory of everything, and uh, it was all very exciting and uh, a, little, a little hard to believe. And, and this, these were very heady days. So let me give you an example. 1990, in the 1990s, probably 1990 or 1991, I was, I was wandering around Harvard. And on a bulletin board, there was a piece of paper with some quotes from famous string theorists. At least I think they were all string theorists, if my memory is correct. That they had made around 1980, well, probably 1985 rather than 1987, as I've written here. So here's one from Witten. 
More physics has been done in the last few years than has been done in a century. I think this is about right. I couldn't find the quote. I'm sure he doesn't like to remember this one. But um, somebody had written a little bit of graffiti. Which century? The 12th? <laughs> all right, well, let's turn back to our story. Super duper string theory was all over the place at Princeton and a few other uh, institutions, and people were very excited. But there was a problem that gradually became clear to them, which is, remember this business of compactification? You have to take the 10 dimensions and get them down to four if you want to figure out what the particles of nature actually are. And it's not like there are five of those. There are, uh, well, first they do about a few hundred, and then they do about a few million, and then they do about a few trillion. The mathematicians kept thinking of more, and the physicists kept thinking of more, and, and there was no principle to choose. No calculational technique available to try to explain to you how nature would select one over the other. And the super duper string theorists were pretty confident that nature was going to pick the most beautiful of these, whatever that meant, um, and that it was going to do so through some simple mechanism that they would eventually understand. But they didn't know what it was, and they were stuck. Well, that's where we were in 1987 or 1988 when I went off to be a graduate student, and this was what one might term the string theory doldrums. It lasted a few years. Pretty much my, my entire graduate uh, career, I was learning, uh, I was at Stanford, I was learning particle physics and quantum field theory and string theory, and my PhD is about applications of string theory techniques for quantum field theory calculations. So I, you know, I was involved in, in a small way. But they really weren't, uh, they really didn't make a lot of progress until a little bit later um, when I went off to be a postdoc at Rutgers University in 1993. And right about that time, at Rutgers and at Princeton, began what might, one might term the great advance. Sometimes this is called the third string revolution. I don't know whether it deserves such a term, but I will call it the great advance. It really was a significant moment. And it actually began in quantum field theory with the discovery of something called uh, sometimes just duality. But I prefer to call it quantum equivalence. And here's what this is. You take two quantum field theories with different types of particles in them. Obviously, they're different. Nope. Sometimes, for the magic of quantum mechanics, things that look entirely different, if you look at them naively, turn out to be the same. Now, that can really be a remarkable uh, shaking of your view of the world if you think that the particles in one theory could somehow not characterize the theory entirely. That you could take a different theory with different particles, and yet it could be the same as the one you started with in some very non-trivial way. Well, okay, this was uh, an idea which really goes back to the 70s. It had been thought about a bit before, but in 1994 it really came to roost. And, and um, I started working on that um, following uh, Cyberg and Witten, who were the two people who really pushed this forward. Um, and then the next year, beginning of 1995, it was shown that all five of those strings, remember those there were five string theories that were shown to be consistent? Turns out there's only one. They were all quantum equivalent to each other. Well, this was quite a revelation, and this set things off. So let me tell you a little bit about what I know uh, about how this happened. I wasn't actually at, well, I wasn't doing string theory, so I didn't go to the string theory conference in 1995, but I kind of wish I had. Because Edward Witten gave the first talk, and it was a spectacular revelation about quantum equivalence and string theories. In fact, Hull and Townsend had already investigated quite a bit of this, but this was the first time that most string theorists learned that this was the case. And it was, a, it was an absolutely shocking talk. And Nathan Seiberg, poor guy, was next. He had to fill those shoes. So what he said was, well, I, gosh, I feel like a truck driver. And then he went off to give a spectacular talk on quantum equivalence and quantum field theories. And he was followed by John Schwartz. Remember John Schwartz? He's the guy who, one of the guys who proved uh, mathematical consistency of string theory, and he said, well, I feel like I'm pushing a wheelbarrow. <laughs> but that was the beginning of the third phase of string theory. Okay, 